Today's episode of Lone Star Lawyers on the Varsity Podcast Network is brought to you by Varsity Search. Varsity Search builds great teams by connecting lawyers in Texas with career opportunities at small and boutique law firms. So if you're thinking of making a move or your law firm is looking to hire, please go to varsitysearch.com and book a time to visit right into my calendar. Varsity Search, building great teams. Hey everyone, Daniel here back with you on Lone Star Lawyers. I hope you and your family are both healthy and safe. Before we get into this episode, I want to let you know that we are currently conducting searches for attorneys all over the state, actually, ranging from construction law in Dallas to family law in Tarrant County and uh, commercial litigation in San Antonio. These and other positions are listed on our website, varsitysearch.com slash lawyers. If you scroll down to the bottom of the page, you'll see them there, or you can email me, daniel at varsitysearch.com for more information. All right, today... We head to Dallas, where our guest is Kevin Cherry. Kevin is a founding partner and board-certified real estate lawyer at Cherry Peterson Landry Alpert. He has an AV preeminent rating by Martindale Hubble, has been recognized by Texas Monthly Magazine as a super lawyer every year since 2006, and is a three-time D Magazine Best Lawyers in Dallas. He is also without a doubt, a lawyer with an entrepreneurial spirit, which I'm sure you'll pick up on as we get into this conversation. So let's do that right now. We'll hop in with Kevin Cherry on today's Monday Mentors episode of Lone Star Lawyers. Kevin Cherry joins us right now, and Kevin, I just uh, want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. It's a real pleasure to catch up with you. Happy to do it. Happy to be here. Well, first off, uh, I would love for you to share with us uh, about your firm, and I'd say that oftentimes to most of our guests, sometimes it's their firm as they are an employee, other times it's actually their firm, you're the f- latter. Um, and so I, I just uh, would love to hear about your firm, how how you know how it came to be and um, a little bit about your practice. So uh, sh- share with us what's going on. Well, I have to give you a little bit of a history. Uh, Please. To, to give you the full story. Um, I came out of law school and went to work for a Dallas firm that was, uh, I guess, a fairly good sized firm at the time, about 65 lawyers at the time. It's now... Um, a lot bigger than that. So it was a, it was a major firm at the time. And I was there for about three years and really was not really ready to go to work. Just, I was immature. I <laughs> right. was still in the, maybe in the college lifestyle a little bit too much. Um, and, um, so I didn't. Really- no one, no one listening can identify with that. <laughs> I'm sure not, not including myself. I'm sure we, we- <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I, I showed up and I worked hard, but my heart was not in it. And, no. and, and when I say I worked hard, I worked hard. I mean, I, I worked 11 hour days and I worked weekends and I mean, I, I know people work harder than that. For me, that was working harder than I'd ever worked. Okay. And um, so after about three years, I switched jobs and I went into a non-legal job at a, a real estate company. And I had been trained as a real estate lawyer. I liked the people in the real estate business. I feel like that was a good match for my skill set and, and, and whatnot. And uh, I was just really drawn to the people in the real estate industry. So I thought I'll go work for a real estate company. Well, uh, that was really the worst possible time to make a move like that. And so I did that for a year and a half and really, really, failed. I mean, I just fell flat on my face and um, realized that I'm going to have to do something else. And my most marketable skill was being a lawyer. So I was very fortunate that I got a job with a great company as an in-house attorney. And at that point in time, I had matured and I was ready to go to work. 
And so I would say that was 1986. So I was probably 28 years old. And at that point, I hit it and I hit it hard and really started having what I would consider professional success, uh, meaning that I felt like I was doing a good job. The people I was, that I was working with felt like I was doing a good job. And so I really enjoyed that. I thought I'm in the perfect job. And I was there for about three and a half years. And then I, that job, that company wound up. Basically, it was acquired by another company. And, and I had a decision to make, where do I go? And so I took some time off. I had an offer from a large firm in Dallas to go to their real estate section. I accepted it and then called back the next day and told them I changed my mind. Um, because I knew that just wasn't the path I wanted to be on. Even though that's a great path, it wasn't the path I wanted to be on. And I had a little bit of an entrepreneurial bent. So eventually, uh, I decided I'm going to hang my own shingle. And I hung my own shingle coming from an in-house attorney position with a company that no longer existed. <laughs> right. It's the the possibly the most counterintuitive thing you could do. Right. But I had relationships, my old firm, I had a great relationship with my old firm. Um, and I thought, you know, I can do this. And so in 91, I hung my shingle. And basically the real estate market was in recovery in 91. And so gradually, um, again, I had a lot of relationships because I'd been at different companies. I had, I was from Dallas, I was involved in different things here, had gone to school in Texas. So I had all these different networks of relationships, which I had maintained, and it just started working. And I really, really enjoyed it. And so uh, I had another firm that was a national firm, a real estate firm approached me about being their regional counsel for this, this area. Yeah. And that was after about a year and a half. And I said, oh, gosh, it's very tempting because their partner was a major Wall Street investment bank. And it was at the beginning of commercial Mac, commercial back uh, mortgages, that business in the early 90s. And I thought I might, it might, this might be too good to pass up. And I effectively worked for them from eight to five and then worked in my practice after five o'clock for about six months with a view to going with them full time. And after five months, I said, guys, you know what? I'm going to go back to my little solo shop over here, which was, a, I think, surprising to them. But it was just the right fit for me. Long story short, I was on my own until about the mid 90s for about probably five years. And then I gradually started getting people to join me. And uh, over time, you know, we, we were a real estate boutique. We only did real estate transactions until about 2009. And then we added a litigation group. Right. So now uh, we've got 20 lawyers, 15 of them, uh, the numbers, it's either 14, 15 or 16. I can't remember. Are real estate transactional people like me, and we've got five litigators. Yeah, yeah. Wow, what a story! And I mean, I, I hope that people listening will get some comfort and some inspiration uh, from the fact that they may not have it all figured out at year two or four or six or even later <laughs> uh, in their practice, um, but that there is still a path out there that they can find that uh, can fit them well, as as you obviously did. Um, what uh, since you you've just told that amazing story. Uh, what were, do you, do you remember a, a point or two along that way where you were uh, either maybe not uh, discouraged or panicked, but just, you know, okay, what's going on here? Why, why can't I just, I'm sure you're probably looking around at others of your contemporaries who seemed like they probably had it all figured out um, and had been at a, at a stable place for, you know, however many years since law school, did that ever sit in? Were you ever kind of looking around thinking, you know, uh, am I doing something wrong here or is there something wrong with me or, or did you deal with any of that? Or if so, how? Oh, oh yeah. A hundred percent. Um, <laughs> one of my best friends, um, uh, started at the firm that I started at the exact same day. And his name is also Kevin. And we, office next to each other. We were both in the real estate section and he's been at that firm 
ever since. And he, became right. the man, he became the managing partner of that firm. If I was going to hire a lawyer, I'd hire him. And he is an amazing guy and a, and a, and a great lawyer. And, um, and we were really good friends. But it was obvious that he, the, the, that experience, that situation resonated with him in a way it didn't resonate with me. And we had we reported to the same uh, partner, young partner there. And I remember sitting down with that young partner who was a, also a great attorney and a great guy. He was a little bit more like me because he did have an entrepreneurial event. And one day we just talked and I was probably a second year lawyer. And he just said, man, you're not you're not you're not there. You're not fully vested. Your heart is not in this. Why do you think that is? And and I couldn't explain it. And so I definitely felt that way. And um, that's not to say there was anything at all wrong with that firm or or wrong with me, frankly. It was just my path. And I had to I had to grow into, I think, the lawyer that or the person that I ultimately became. So you just got to keep plugging away um, and, and don't I, I didn't. I never really, really got down on myself. Uh, I, I guess I did a little bit, a little discouraged. But I, I, I knew that I just had to keep plugging. I'm, I'm willing to try stuff. I here at the firm, I call myself the king of bad ideas because I'll have a lot of ideas and a lot of them aren't worth pursuing, and and some are. But I think you just have to keep. Keep at it. And sometimes that means persevering, staying where you are, doing exactly what you're doing. And sometimes that means making a change. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. What a, what a, what a neat story. And um, on the practice of real estate law and, and real estate transactions, um, what, what's the current state of things in that uh, area? You mentioned kind of riding the ups and downs of the real estate market over the years. Um in uh in in 2020 kind of what what in the last maybe year or two what what's been going on within the real estate world and um and maybe even touching on are are there things uh, what what would be hot topics at a uh, real estate CLE uh right now that's interesting um so my my perspective on real estate lawyers is a little different because I did have that year and a half where I worked for a real estate company yeah. in in a business capacity and so I got uh, just an exposure to that industry that that I wouldn't have otherwise had. A lot of times, real estate lawyers, and on most deals, real estate lawyers come in late in the process. Mm-hmm. So the deal is maybe 75% done, and then the lawyers get involved a lot of times. And so uh, there's a lot of work that goes on that lawyers don't see. There's a lot of deals that don't come together that lawyers don't see. So I only say that to say that a lawyer's perspective, what's going on in the real estate market is sort of a trailing perspective. Yeah. Right. It's not really on the front end of stuff. Right. Um, so that's, and that's my perspective. And I'll tell you what, I, what I'm seeing is that um, the retail real estate business is really tough. Yeah. The office real estate business is really tough. The industrial warehouse real estate business is pretty good. The residential real estate business is good. And I say that because I think the multifamily business is pretty good. And then the single family business is very good. Okay. So that's kind of an overview. Those are the sort of the yeah. main product types. And, and I would say that uh, the real estate lawyers that I know are, are fairly busy. Uh, the um, Our firm has been fairly busy uh in you know we compared to last year last year was a really good year um and we're not very far off of last year so that's our is that is that are there consistencies or discrepancies between markets um either within texas or texas versus other states so when we look at maybe those real estate breakdowns you just gave in dallas versus austin or houston or rural areas or what are, are, are there kind of any kind of distinguishing points uh, within kind of breaking it down further? No, not, not that I could offer uh, yeah. most of, 
Texas is such a great real estate market. There's a lot of business here. And so that keeps us busy. I'm working on a we work. We just got a hotel deal in yesterday in Louisiana. So, you know, we do get stuff. And I got a deal the other day in in Arkansas. Uh, So we do get some stuff out of the state. But but there's so much business in Texas and and real estate practice is local. I mean, you you'll have uh, like we're working on a deal with uh, with uh, 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 our client has an investor and the investor uses a big firm and they're out of Cincinnati. And so you got a Cincinnati lawyer working on a Texas deal. So it does happen. You can cross. It doesn't change that much. And I've done deals in a lot of different states. But right now, you know, if you read the newspaper, I mean, Texas is such a great place to be that most of what we're seeing and, and really the only thing I have any in insight at all on is, is Texas stuff. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. And um, so I want to, we, as we talked through uh, the uh, short version of your career uh, building, um, I want to kind of go back to it in a different sense and, and ask you about just the practice of law and uh, maybe something that you learned or picked up in those formative years um, that has stuck with you that you would want to pass along to uh, a young lawyer listening to this right now. What's maybe something that you learned in the practice of law that, that you think is important to know? Well, this is me. <laughs> this is you. I have one bit of advice, and I've got a son in law school. At yeah. uh, he's a second year law student now, so it's the same advice I'd give him: <laughs> get to work early. Yeah, get to work early. That's it. And that that was something I did when I started off. I did it because I didn't want to stay too late, so <laughs> I was. Still a little bit in that college lifestyle, I think. Sure. And so I didn't want to be at work till eight or nine or 10. So I wanted to, I thought if I could get in there at seven 30, I could get out by six 30 and then go have some, you know, do some of the fun stuff. <laughs> right. and, uh, so that's, that's my, that's my one bit of advice. I mean, get to work early seven or seven 30, I'd say, you know, and, and the, the downside of that is a lot of, a lot of the people that you report to aren't there that early. Right. Um, and so maybe you don't get the quote unquote FaceTime, right. That you, you know, you, you would do. And I, and I, I don't want to call out my good buddy, but that good buddy who I told you about, who was yeah. a superstar, he didn't get yeah. to work till nine or nine thirty, <laughs> And it wasn't because he was trying to work the FaceTime deal. That was just, he, that's what he liked to do, but he was there till right. very late. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, for me, I, I just like the idea of getting to work early. I think that's that's the kind of the the advice that I learned or the thing I learned early that worked for me. Yeah. And I, w- I would add to that 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 um, I don't think I've said this before on, on the show, but, you know, getting to work early, I, I think, is a wise piece of advice because not only do you give yourself that flexibility to maybe not work what late into the evening, but also I think it allows you to get into the office when, like you said, not many other people are going to be there. And there's something to be said for just having the office essentially to yourself. It's quiet. Um, you're not having to deal with kind of the emergencies that are going to come up throughout the day that kind of take you off course. And it allows you to actually kind of plan out your day if you haven't done that the night before, which is another piece of advice I think I've been given before. I think it's good to think about, you know, maybe laying out the next day's start at least um, the night before. But in any case, uh, taking advantage of that quiet time, because once everybody gets in the office and clients start calling in and others start calling in and I mean, a lot of pulls on your time, emails start dinging in there. Um, you know, it's just, it's tough to stay on task and not get distracted with the now with the emergency, whatever. And so getting that hour, hour and a half, whatever it is, even beforehand, before that kind of all starts, I think is, is super beneficial. I don't know if you found that, uh, to be productive time for you, for you or, or not, but, but that's, I, I I've always seen that, you know, it's, it's, that's true. It's harder. It's harder now because of email, because what happens is you, you get in early and, you just, your default is like going to emails and that's that same sort of yeah. know, people coming at you from, you know, right. Not controlling your schedule. So you really have to uh, kind of guard that time and just that's decide right. 
here's what I'm going to do when I get into work early, uh, whether it's plan your day or, you know, read or whatever it is. Uh, yeah. Right. But I think that's, I think it's, I just think it's the way to go. I really do. And, uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's really been probably the one habit, uh, that I've had all throughout my career, really going back to early, early, early days. That's that stayed with me. Yeah, no, that's good stuff. Um, when you think about some of the associates that you've uh, hired and had work for you over the years, um, what one, one or two things that a young associate can do to impress you, to stand out, to uh, uh, give you confidence that they're on the right track, that they're uh, someone you can count on? You know, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that you can tell when people care about their job, meaning I think you can tell when people care about how they're not, how they're doing. Everybody cares about, Hey, how am I doing? You know, Oh, I need, you know, you hear a lot of times, even as a young associate, I remember, you know, we're not getting any feedback. Uh, you know, nobody's really telling me how I'm doing and it would be more productive if we had, you know, more frequent reviews and stuff like that. And I'm not really talking about that. I'm saying if you're working on a project and with another attorney, with a, with a younger attorney, and they really care about the quality of the work that they're doing. Yeah. I think you can tell. I think you can tell that. I think that comes through. And, I, you know, you can call it passion or you can call it other things, I'm sure. But I think if, if you really, really care about that memo or about that contract, that's going to come through. If you're just sort of punching the clock, uh, maybe not – giving your best effort. Um, because I think a lot of times people come out of law school and think, Hey, I'm smart. I'm, I'm talented. I can kind of, I can kind of do a pretty good job and it'll just be really good because I'm smart and you know, I'm a good guy and whatnot. Right. But I think you really, it's probably like pro playing, you know, pro sports or something. You, you, you might be at that level, but you really, excel when you really add effort to all that talent. So yeah. I think really just really caring about every single project you do. I think that that comes through. And if you don't, it's not a deal killer or career killer, but I do think that people that really do care, it stands out. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And, and uh, like you said, it, it, it can only make your work better um, if you add that level of care and concern and passion for it, um, for sure. And, and I think that's actually what makes it really hard. Uh, I mean, it, it, using, using your own example, I mean, when you're in a situation where your maybe heart's not all the way in it, but when you're in a, a, a position or a firm that, you know, you could tell, others could probably tell. Um, and, and that makes it hard to, to, to succeed, to do well there. And, uh, and so it may be an indication that you're not quite in the right spot. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that, that stuff matters. Um, and it's really hard to, to spend all the time that we do if you're a practicing lawyer, um, and, and all of the stresses that come with it, all of the, how hard work it is. Um, if you don't have that level of, of caring, otherwise, yeah, just to do it for, for the money. I mean, they're, you know, or, or, or punching the clock. I mean, that's, that's a tough world to live in. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's not really a perfectionism thing. It's not really saying no, no. You know, it's, it's really more saying, you know, I kind of care enough to really try to understand in my world sort of the deal or the client or the motivations or uh, and not just taking the form and filling it out or uh, just, you know, just trying to get it sort of turned back around, uh, yeah. you know, meaning hitting the deadline. Uh, I think it's more about just really thinking about it in, in trying to – and it's hard to do that deal after deal after deal after deal. And in, in my world, why I like my world is that sort of your, your, your deal turnaround time is much shorter than say litigation. We've got a, right, right. we've got a case here where it's a big case for us and our non, our, our, our guys that are working, I have been working on it for four years mm -hmm. and the case just got postponed of course, January, yes. January of 2022. Oh, it was scheduled for trial in August and it got, that would drive me nuts. And so, 
you know, but but on a, even in that world, a deposition after deposition after deposition, and or in a real estate deal, a lease after a lease after a lease, it's it's really hard to do that to have that level of just really caring about it and understanding it consistently. Uh, but I think that's that's the goal. Uh, I think ultimately, uh, you know, I said I was, there's that saying, you know, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And I think if you can sort of bring that, then it just gets people's attention because, and it resonates not just with uh, maybe partners or, or senior associates or others at a law firm that you're working with, but it really resonates with clients. I was going to say, yeah, the clients definitely can pick up on that, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, no, absolutely. Well, um, I want to ask you a little bit about hiring and uh, some of the some thoughts you might have on that. Um, when, when you go through a process of hiring a, a new associate, um, what are some of the critical things that you're looking for to determine whether they are a uh, a good fit or a good prospect for joining your firm? Well, taking a step back, this is yeah. a small firm perspective on hiring. Yeah, and. Um, uh, I'll just tell you for small firms, it's very inexact. <laughs> yeah. it, is, it is talk about stream of consciousness. It's, it's all over the map. And that's true. That's been true for our firm as well. So um, we didn't hire uh, out of law school until really a couple of years ago. And we would, we would, we just hired laterally from people that we knew or, um, somehow. And um, literally, we, we hired a, a, an attorney that was a couple years out of law school and who was a guy that was moving from litigation over real estate. He wanted to get out of litigation. But that's not hiring somebody out of law school. And literally about, I guess about three years ago, a friend called me up and said, hey, there's this friend of mine that she's coming out of law school and I'd like for you to talk to her. And I said, okay, I'll talk to her. I I'd, I'd love talking to people like that. And she came in and interviewed and I just said, I called my partner in. I said, I think we need to hire her. And we literally hired her on the spot. And I think that since then we've gotten a little bit more intentional about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But for me there, I look for some kind of connection personally, something in their history that I, fi I find uh, compelling for one reason or another. Uh, it can be, like in that situation, it was the fact that the guy that referred her to me was very close friends with her family, and I thought the world of that guy. Yeah. So basically because if he recommended her, that got my attention. Sure. Uh, for for other people, it's been actually something in their career, in their resume, in their like academic performance, yeah. where we've said, "Wow, that's very impressive." Um, for that's that was the second person we hired uh, uh, out of out of law school. Uh, the the next couple of folks, we've got two, well, actually three that we fired out of law school that are starting this fall, and all sort of different stories, but uh, I would say that, that there's just something that is in their, again, their history or their academic career or their extracurricular career, something that just, you know, I have, I, I find either interesting or a connection to, or I know a little bit about uh, an organization they were involved in and, and, you know, I, I like that organization or I think that's a, a great group, uh, you know, and so it, it's not um, it's not a super objective thing. Right. Yeah. It's not a great point. It's not, it's not a yeah. whatever. Uh, it's it's something just in that about that person. It's very individual and it's about that person. I mean, there's a guy that that I that what we hired. Uh, he's a he's a lateral that he'd written a symphony. <laughs> wow. And yeah, I thought, wow, he wrote a symphony. That's yeah. pretty cool. That takes something. <laughs> like, yeah. Last question on this. 
Um, what about with within an interview situation itself? Are are there any common mistakes that you've seen candidates make in the interview uh, that have uh, cost them, or or maybe something that is that you that you've seen candidates do that that are helpful to their uh, to the interview that that uh, that helps them stand out more? Well, easy for me to say, but I think the most important thing somebody can do in an interview is just relax. Just relax and be themselves. Um, and I have, you know, it's been a while, but I remember my first interview in law school. Um, I was so nervous and I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I didn't get braces until I was in law school. OK, ah, so yeah. and I chose to get braces right before the beginning of my second year. So I'd had my braces on for about a week. And then I had my first interview. <laughs> so you were feeling super oh, confident, right? <laughs> it was disaster. Oh, no. <laughs> it was a disaster. So I guess my point, and I've done, only done a few interviews at law school, but I guess my advice would just be, you know, relax and just be yourself and just let it go. Let it, let just go, let it go where it goes. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I it's funny. Sometimes, uh, I think that's definitely one of the things that candidates just for whatever reason don't spend as much time thinking about is they, you know, they, they will take the time to get prepared, get ready, do all the things. Um, but something, you know, whatever they need to do to relax, they somehow leave that out of the process right before they're, you know, going in for the interview. And I do think that's really important. And so I'm glad that you mentioned it. Well, um, we're, uh, nearly out of time. Is there anything that we haven't touched on yet that you feel like uh, you wouldn't want to uh, leave without sharing for the lawyers in the audience? Well, here's what I would say is um, hang in there. I mean, whatever, whatever stage you're in, if you're interviewing, um, hang in there. And, uh, you know, going back to the comment about interviewing, it, it gets better and you get better at it and you just have to keep doing it. And, uh, you know, yeah. there, there was a great book called what colors your parachute. And it talked about the interviewing, the job search process. And it described the job search process as no, 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 no. Yes. <laughs> right. And that's just, that's just reality. You, you just have to go out and hustle and, uh, stay with it. And, you know, eventually something will, something will turn. And like for me, it was something completely unexpected the way my career turned. It wasn't anything I'd planned or, or anticipated. It just sort of happened. And so I think that's, that's, that's the, that's my experience. That's really good. Well, thanks for that. And we've got a few rapid fire questions to end our time. If you're ready, we'll jump into those. Yeah, please. All right. Name one trait or characteristic you most want to see in an associate. I said, I said caring and compassion. So I won't say that again. I'll say humility. Humility. Good. Humility. Yeah. What habit has been key to your success? Keeping up my relationships with people that have crossed my path. Awesome. Awesome. Your favorite app or productivity tool? I'm going to go app on that, and I'm going to go podcasts. And I like podcasts, and I'm currently listening to Megan Kelly and Michael Lewis and Malcolm yeah. Gladwell and Tim Keller. I like I like those podcasts. Man, good good mix there. Um, and uh, I've been listening through Michael Lewis's too, um, one of my favorite authors. And so I'll put the links to all those in the show notes uh, for people to grab on if they want a podcast to listen to. Um, obviously, after they listen to this one, of course. Um, <laughs> your uh, favorite social distancing activity? I guess I'd say uh, bicycling. Bicy I started cycling yeah. about two months ago and I yeah. really enjoyed it. Uh, I, I ran a whole bunch and I was looking and didn't stop. And I was looking for something else to do and start cycling. And that's been a blast. That's awesome. Yeah. I think a lot of bicycles have been bought over the last seven months. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, and lastly, your favorite legal movie. I have, I'm going to have to give you a long answer to this. Is that okay? Please. That's fine. Okay. First of all, it's not my cousin Vinny. 
Uh, well, that, okay. that's going to put you in a, a category about uh, in the other 50%, because it's about 50% my cousin of Eddie, about 50% something else. So that's the, good. The second comment I'd make, is that <laughs> if Wedding Crashers is technically a lawyer movie, then, I mean, they were lawyers, right? They were. That's okay. a great call. So keep that in mind. I but love it. If that's not, then probably the one that, uh, there's a lot of great ones, The Verdict, Michael Clayton. Yeah, no. If, yep. you, if you know that one, and then Paper Chase, which is old school, but oh, it is. if I'm going to say one, it's going to be a movie called Breaker Morant. So I want to hear you t- give a little synopsis of that. I have it on our list. I put together this big list of legal movies that we're going to deep dive into on the show here, and that's on the list. I'd never heard of it before I put it on the list as I was going through kind of these you know, best lawyer movies, whatever. So I would love to hear your... Uh, brief synopsis of the kind of outline the movie. Well, it's been a while since I've seen it, but I've seen it <laughs> a few times and uh, it's essentially a war trial. Okay. And um, the two main characters are the lawyer and the defendant. And the lawyer just does everything he can for this defendant. And in a sense, the defendant is innocent And in a sense, the defendant is guilty. So it's very, you feel very conflicted uh, about just everything. And uh, in in any way, and uh, the lawyer is, and and the defendant are both very likable and admirable guys. But I think the lawyer is, is kind of, is the kind of lawyer you'd want to be. And so I like the movie for that reason. And uh, it's got great acting and it's got a great ending and, so I would tell you, watch Breaker Morant. It's fantastic. I'm, I can't wait to see it. It really is. It's on the top of a lot of lists. And uh, so I'm excited to see it. And we're excited to do it on the show here at some point. So thanks for, I think, being the first one to mention it for many of the guests. So I'm glad that you did. Well, uh, Kevin, again, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. We really appreciate it. And uh, best of luck uh, with your firm. And, and uh, uh, we look forward to catching up with you again soon. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed visiting with you, Daniel, and good luck to you. I know you're doing a great job and you'll continue to do a great job. And I look forward to crossing paths with you again. All right. My thanks again to Kevin Cherry for joining us on the show. If you enjoyed this episode, would you consider doing two things for me? Would you subscribe so you don't miss an episode? And then would you rate and review the podcast in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? If you have suggestions or thoughts about the show or if I can help you in any way, please email me directly, daniel at varsitysearch.com. Also, don't forget to check our website for several opportunities that we are currently searching for. That's at varsitysearch.com slash lawyers if you scroll to the bottom. All right, that's it for today's episode of Lone Star Lawyers. Thanks again so much to each of you for listening. I'm Daniel Hare with Varsity Search, and we'll talk with you next time. 